I've been going to the chamber meetings now for a couple of years. I know I've had a chance to uh, meet a number of you, and if I haven't, hopefully I, I can in uh, one of the future meetings. So Fra Frank invited me here to come here to speak and kind of gave me just a, a real broad area just talking about just police in general. And there's a lot of information to cover here. Frank says I have 20 minutes, and uh, he's going to pull the plug, so I believe him. He's, a, he's an ex-Marine, so I'm going to listen to him and get get done with this in 20 minutes. And hopefully we have some time for questions at the end. I'm going to have to hover around here too just because I like to walk around, but I don't have a remote, so I'll do my best with that. So t today what I just want to try to cover is uh, just a few points, just talking uh, an overview of Oakdale Police, where we've been, where we are, and the direction we're, we're starting to head. Uh, some information on crime activity, some statistics, uh, it's not all of them, just uh, some of the ones people tend to be interested in. Uh, touch on behavioral health, uh, emerging issues that we're, we're dealing with in the East Metro, specific to Oakdale as well, and some of the future challenges that uh, we're seeing. So where I'll start here is just kind of where we've been. You see that when uh, we started 68, there's one officer, and in 24, we're at uh, 37. That's the, that's the first Oakdale squad car picture I could find was a 1970 Ford wagon and of course what we're driving here today. Get a lot of questions. People ask how many officers Oakdale have. So uh, I throw this in different PowerPoints I do to show uh, what our licensed staff is. So just briefly going to touch on this. This is what our command structure looked like for the police department for I mean really about the last 30 years. And uh, in 24, we're starting to make some, some changes. We did a, uh, the city had us do a staffing assessment that uh, they supported for us to identify, uh, you know, some areas we can improve in with staff, uh, different recommendations to improve the police department. And what that, that looks like, what we're doing this year, 24, we're uh, adding a captain's position. We're uh, making our structure a little more consistent with con contemporary law enforcement agencies where we're gonna have <laughs> Oversight for criminal investigations, support services, and a, a captain that solely focuses on, on patrol work, because that's, of course, uh, the backbone of our police department is patrol, and that's where most of our officers' work is in that division. And you'll see some other things we've added, uh, a school resource officer, um, and in total added three positions in 2024, and look to continue building and uh, adding positions where we need to better serve the community. So I'm going to get into some stats here. I'm just going to rifle through these. I'll, I'll spend some time on some more of the uh, important ones, but uh, it's hard for you guys to see. This is just a slide that covers like, what, how busy is Oakdale Police? What, uh, what are their calls for service annually? Uh, it's really somewhere calls for service between 16 and 20,000 calls for service annually. Uh, that blue column represents how many actual police reports are done. I make that distinction because in years past, uh, that's how you evaluated how busy a police department was by how many reports they generated. Well, of course, not every 911 call equals a police report. So that blue column is specifically towards crime reports and different areas where reports are required. This is the uh, what arrests look like in the city of Oakdale. Past five years, you see 551 adult arrests in 2019. And we're currently in 23, you know, staying fairly consistent with uh, just over 400 arrests for adults a year. Whereas with juveniles, that bottom orange line, that's about how many juveniles were you arrest a year. Uh, it stayed pretty consistent the last five years. Okay, so assaults. Uh, this just depicts the amount of assaults we have in Oakdale over the last five years. It's been increasing slightly. That blue column shows you that uh, in 2023, we had 189 reported assaults in the city of Oakdale. Uh, what's more concerning to me is that orange column, which is aggravated assaults. Those are assaults with firearms and serious felony assaults. We saw a pretty significant increase with that starting in 2021, uh, you know, with that peak of about 37 aggravated assaults in 22 and 23. Uh, it went down just a little, little bit to, to 34 uh, this past year, but uh, 
that is the stuff that we're concerned about is this increase in violence and gun crimes, which I'll, I'll touch on just a, a little bit further in future slide here. So this is firearms crimes in the city of Oakdale. So when I started in Oakdale over two decades ago, firearms crimes were, did not happen that often. I mean, you'd see a few shootings a year. Uh, we've really seen that change post-2020, where increase in gun violence, not only just in, in Oakdale, but just in general in the metro area. There's been far more shootings. That top green line shows you just firearm violations in general, and those are people that uh, shoot guns, you know, unlawful discharges, people carrying a pistol without a permit, and felons in possession of firearms. That's probably one of the higher categories we have is when you arrest somebody and they're uh, not able to have a gun by law, but they're still carrying weapons. That orange line is aggravated assault. Uh, like it, you see a slight increase there in, um, in 20, was it 20, 22, we saw that increase in the amount of aggravated assaults with firearms. Again, that's where that's the concerning things. That's where what we're seeing in the, in the metro here is back years ago when you used to get in a feud with somebody, it was, uh, you know, you fought at the park. It was a fist fight. Um, you know, I look back to when I was growing up. If something happened, I'd run home. If I had to call someone, I had to dial the rotary phone. Uh, it'd take forever. It'd take five minutes to make a phone call to somebody. Uh, and if you had a problem with somebody, you'd have to go physically hop on your bike or get in a car to go find them. Uh, today with these phones, while well, they're, they're fantastic technology that makes our life easier, uh, I personally believe that that's part of why we're seeing this increase is just that, that instant gratification of getting payback on somebody or just hopping on uh, whatever social platform you use to, to diss somebody or disrespect them. And the consequence of that is becoming not a, a fist fight or a, a verbal dispute, it's becoming, I'm gonna get a gun and I'm gonna shoot at you wherever I see you. So that's where we're seeing a lot of those gun crimes happen here in East Metro. And just on the right side, it gives you an overall picture. You see in 2022, uh, that's our highest gun crimes on records in the city of Oakdale, is 43 gun-related crimes. In sex-related offenses, this is a, you know, it's sometimes hard to talk about in public, but it is a reality of what your police department deals with quite frequently is sex-related crimes. And as you know that, uh, you might have heard the story in St. Paul, there was a, just a brutal uh, sexual assault where a person broke into a house, uh, raped a female, and it was a, a stranger, not an acquaintance. Um, most of the criminal sexual conduct cases that we deal with, and I would argue mostly in the suburbs and in inner city as well, are usually acquaintance rapes where these people know each other and then there's a, a crime that happens, they're raped. Uh, the the uh, purple column there is sex trafficking. That's become something that's, uh, that we're dealing with uh, more often. It's really a pervasive crime. It's not just so you can patrol your neighborhoods and, and find someone that's being trafficked. The, these are typically through information we get with warning signs, tips. It's usually families, teachers, um, bringing this information to the police. Sometimes it's developed by police just picking up on warning signs. Officers are becoming far more educated with those warning signs uh, of people that are being sexually exploited and uh, ultimately becoming trafficked. So 2023 was the highest number we've had of four documented, and I can tell you that it happens far more often than what we're documenting. We use the Sex Trafficking Task Force in Washington County, or we use the BCA to run with those investigations because those typically are not localized, just the city of Oakdale. These are uh, happening where they may set up shop in a, in a, a rental or a hotel or some other means, even mobile, by car, where they'll set up these, uh, they, usually it's through some kind of social platform that they use to, to connect, and these people are being exploited and trafficked, and these aren't these, uh, like, it, like you picture maybe in the 80s, 90s of prostitutes, 
These are, these are daughters. These are our, our 14, 15 year old kids that are getting taken advantage of. And maybe it's because they have a rough home life or whatever that might be going on in their life where they find someone that appears to be taking care of them and have their best interests uh, with them, but that's not true. And of course, the CAS group does great work. And uh, John Larson is at uh, that group here to provide a presentation. And it's pretty eye-opening if you've never sat through that presentation to realize how that is impacting uh, our communities. Okay, burglaries. So in other states, they might call this breaking and entering, but this is a slide just on burglaries. We've had a, a, a decrease, and in 2023, is. I think the lowest amount that I've seen in the history of the police department. So that is a good sign. Um, the blue column is residential burglaries where homes are broken into and property is stolen, while the orange column is commercial burglaries. So these are your businesses that are, are broken into, uh, whether that is a strip mall business or um, any sort of business that we classify in our, our report system. This just gives you a picture of the amount of theft reports uh, Oakdale handles over the last five years. Uh, <clears throat> we have several hundred a year, um, reached that point in 2020 where we had over 800 reported thefts. It's gone down just a little bit, but again, uh, this is reported thefts, not, not all crimes reported. So this is what we document when someone calls the police and we take police reports. But the orange column next to it is where we started documenting catalytic converter thefts. That became a very popular thing in, in 2020. And we saw a peak of that in 2021 where we had over 150 catalytic converter thefts in our city. And uh, it's going down due to legislation and some other investigative techniques the police are using that uh, are making that decrease. But reality is it's a supply and demand and, and they move on to other things such as copper wire from light poles and other things where they can they can make quick money auto theft this one's a bit of an odd one uh, this has been increasing in the city of Oakdale for years uh, it was increasing since 2019 we hit the peak at 2022 with a hundred auto thefts in our city and uh, it dropped down drastically in, in 2023 with 31. And I would like to say that it was just fantastic work just by the Oakdale officers out there doing patrol. But uh, it was a number of factors that contributed to that. Because the reality is it's a, that, that auto theft group, the Kia boys and other groups that get into this, uh, this thrill of stealing cars, it's really a small group. And we believe that a very small group was doing that in East Metro, North St. Paul, Oakdale, Maplewood, Woodbury, and you know, due to some different uh, strategies in policing, uh, I think that led to decreasing. I believe in 23, more people were incarcerated that were involved in those groups. Also, I gotta give a head nod to, uh, to Ramsey County. They have a group dedicated solely to auto theft investigations. They have uh, analysts that analyze information and in, in your typical suspects. It is very useful in tracking down these people that are responsible. <clears throat> Here's a picture of search warrants. This is kind of an interesting one that I want to share this with you is just that you see that increase in search warrants where it's been increasing over the last five years. We hit over 120 search warrants in 2023. And really it's just a, it's consistent with advent and technology. And now your, your, your phones that are in your hand are, they're, they're computers. They hold a lot of valuable data. Uh, data of your, the crimes you've been involved in, locations you've been, and all kinds of different information. It's also become an expectation for prosecution teams is that uh, when you arrest somebody for a crime and there's maybe some evidence on their phone, the expectation is that we're going to do a search warrant. So we, we, we expect that that's going to continue to grow. But what's kind of interesting with that increase is this technology requires specialized training for extracting that information. It's not like you just plug in your phone and it downloads this into a uh, information 
telling a, a crime story in a timeline. So the ex it's expensive. The software to analyze this information is very expensive. And it just keeps getting more and more complicated and we keep finding ways to keep up with that change and those expectations of what's expected for, for trial. Okay, I'm gonna talk a few minutes on behavioral health. Behavioral health is something that police departments across the nation are, are starting to recognize and starting to develop different strategies to, to help and provide services to community members that are struggling with behavioral health. But with the end goal is that, uh, you know, there's people that called 911 and the police respond to their home 40, 50 times a month. Uh, so we're looking at finding different ways to, what can we do better? Especially with like suicidal person's calls. I mean, police department typically is just who gets called to those. And it, it creates a very awkward situation when the only person that can respond to that location at three in the morning is a police officer because that's who's out on the street. And then you're introducing a weapon to someone who's suicidal. And we're trying to get smarter in our approach and finding different ways to mitigate issues with, with folks that are suffering from mental health, providing them services, support. And oftentimes those are, can be people that have suicidal ideations, uh, people that are looking for law enforcement to end their life as a simple means. So police officers are getting a lot of training on de-escalation, using space, time, their environment to their advantage to create a distance. So they're not put in a situation where it could be a lethal encounter. And that takes a lot of time and shift really in law enforcement thinking where back when I started, it was if there was someone that was having a mental health crisis, you went into their home, you wrestled with them, put them in handcuffs, and you brought them to the hospital. Whereas today, law enforcement's taken many steps to do everything we can to not make this a physical encounter, but using all the resources we have available, using time, locating family member information to help create uh, uh, communication with that person that's in crisis. But when we look in Oakdale, we really started tracking this information, really put it in place in 2021. And I know that shows a drastic increase. It's not realistic in the sense we weren't, we weren't tracking appropriately. That's, so we have about 1,300 behavioral health calls documented in, in 2023 which is about 10% of the police calls that we deal with, but we believe that that number is actually closer to 25 to 30%, uh, just because tracking mental health information, behavioral health information is, is a challenge. Police officers are not, uh, uh, they're not doctors, they're not, they're not nurses, they're not social workers, so they're doing the best they can to make these, these, these points of recognizing what may be behavioral health and document that appropriately. So we think we are doing a better job and it's going to continue to do better. And some of the things Oakdale's doing is looking at uh, securing grant funding to start a uh, embedded social worker working with the police department, having a, uh, a response group that consists of a police officer and a social worker. Not so much to, to respond to the person in crisis at the time, while that may be part of the role it's really the case management follow-up portion of this where people may be in crisis and there's nothing the police can do. And what we typically do is if they're not a harm to other people or clearly a harm to themselves, we just walk away. So having someone follow up with these folks to maybe reduce the 911 calls that we're receiving from the same people over and over, but also using the the knowledge and the resources of the social worker to, to put them on a path to, to resources that can help them. Because unfortunately, what we found by not taking steps to, to really focus on what we can do to help our community that's in crisis or suffering from behavioral health, is uh, it gets to a point where it's too late, where some of these folks just need to go to the hospital um, and they gotta be civilly committed because they cannot function in society. So we're trying to get ahead of that and, and develop plans for how we can manage those 
behavioral health calls better. So hand in hand with behavioral health is just narcotics, narcotics violations, and uh, paints a picture of what the narcotic situation is in Oakdale with the amount of arrests that are made uh, related to narcotics. See, in uh, 2022, there's 116 incidents where someone was either in possession of a controlled substance or they were involved in the sale of it. And that orange column represents just possession of narcotic devices. So just whatever vehicle they're using to, to, to use that drug uh, sometimes can be a crime in and of itself. So those are documented as well. And you can see there's been a fairly steady increase in, in what we're dealing with on the streets in Oakdale. So I'm going to talk a little bit about narcotics and overdoses. So the police and fire departments are starting to, to again, evolve and, and do better tracking on this. But uh, I will go to the fire department data first, because I think that's, again, those are paramedics. They're better trained at recognizing when, when someone's an overdose. But if you just look at those stats for 2022, 2023, that gray column is how many times the fire department has uh, had what they call an overdose protocol. And then 2023, that raised to 53 times where they've had overdose protocol. And that column to the right that's yellow, that's how many times Narcan has been administered. 14 times in 2022, 20 times in 2023. And that's not even accounting for, there's a lot of drug users that carry their own Narcan and they, they use it themselves from overdosing. And the police department data, you see that there's an increase where that's just police officers saying that these, these people are obviously overdosing. That was 28 times in 23, and they've administered, administered Narcan six times on the street. And by law now, we are required that officers in the community have to have Narcan with them because we are in a crisis with fentanyl overdoses. And I'm going to touch on that in just a minute. So fentanyl, anything that I talk about today, this is the one thing I want you to remember. Just please remember this. If you have kids, grandkids, people you love that may be using or maybe in a situation where they could potentially use a drug, please talk to them about fentanyl. Because I'm concerned about this myself. My, my son is graduating high school. He's off to Iowa State next year to go to college. And this is my number one conversation I have with him, is going to, if you're in college in the 80s and 90s, going to a party and someone says, here, man, take this, or here, smoke this. Right? You may do that. It's in your conscience. You're young. You, people may recreationally use drugs or just want to get that extra buzz or that extra high with, with drinking. Uh, that can't happen anymore because of fentanyl. So fentanyl overdoses, these are not people that are in a dark alley with needles shoved in their arm. These are your neighbors. These are business people. These are kids, college students that are dying. And this is a crisis. So over on this right side here, that, it's, it's hard to see, but that's what fentanyl looks like. This little bit compared to a penny, that's considered a fatal dose of fentanyl. And there's some other pictures of what fentanyl looks like. This is what fentanyl is being used for in our communities. Uh, counterfeit hydrocodone, oxycodone, Xanax. People are making counterfeit pills that are made with fentanyl. Some of these folks are people that are recovering from knee injuries. That maybe their doctor put them on Percocet, oxycodone, some kind of painkiller. Uh, the doctor says, no, you can't, I'm not putting you on this anymore. This person develops an addiction. They talk to a friend or someone at the gym. Hey, I know somebody who can get you this. Right? This person picks it up, oh, it's got an M and a 30, just like the stuff I got from my pharmacist and doctor. Well, then it's not. It's fentanyl. Because fentanyl is an FDA-approved drug. Uh, it's an opioid, a synthetic opioid, and it's 100 times stronger than morphine. It's 50 times stronger than heroin. And this is what we're facing today in our communities. 
So you think that this may not be an issue for Washington County. Minnesota is a major distributing hub for narcotics, including fentanyl, methamphetamine, straight from the cartel from Mexico to here, and it spreads out through the Midwest. Just in Washington County last year, the largest fentanyl seizure in state history was right here in Washington County. The street value of over $2.2 million. Uh, it was kind of a network all over. I think it was tied to an address in Cottage Grove was the, the main piece of it. So this stuff is happening in your communities. And I can't stress the importance of this enough. This is just Minnesota Department of Health data. This runs uh, a couple years behind, but just in 2022, over 1,000 Minnesotans died of fentanyl overdose. You see that sharp increase? That's just uh, what's, what's known. There's, there's other ones that may not be known. This is what it looks like nationally. In 2022, over 70, almost 74,000 people died of fentanyl overdose in our country. And why this is so concerning is that there's people that are not knowingly consuming this. It's one thing to say, I'm gonna go buy methamphetamine. It's a controlled substance and I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna get high and experience whatever experience you have with that. These are people that think they're getting a pain pill. I think they're, they're, they're curing an injury they have if in, in, through an addiction to help them get through it. Okay, I'm going to switch gears. Uh, I know Frank has me on this type timeline. You're close to the end. Okay, get close. Get close. Six minutes or four. All right, perfect. No. I forgot. You were so interesting. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get through this quick. So. You want to talk about future challenges. These next few slides are, are, are disgusting to me, but uh, I want to give an example to all of you of what law enforcement's facing. These are just direct data from the BCA. 2023, over 1,100 police officers in Minnesota were assaulted. 304 aggravated assaults against police officers. This is 2024, the first quarter of the year. Uh, there's already been, already been over 200 assaults on police officers. Uh, and two murder. And this gives an example of assaults that are occurring just in the city of Oakdale. These are documented assaults on Oakdale police officers. In 2022, nine officers were assaulted, 23, seven. This year already, I believe we're at four officers assaulted. But this last slide, this is what I want to talk about. We talk about recruitment, retention, future challenges in law enforcement. This is data on the number of times police officers have been assaulted with firearms. So look at that increase from 2004, hardly any incidents, to 2023, where 58 times police officers were shot at. Since 2023, 19 police officers have been shot. Uh, three have been killed. And this is just an increasing trend. And what we're looking at in 2024, there's been 17 reported firearm assaults on officers. And what that looks like, if that trend continues this year, there will be over 70 uh, firearm assaults on police officers. So why is this happening? I think there's a, a number of things we could probably all come up with why. But what's more concerning for, for Oakdale Police and other police departments in Minnesota Who's going to want to do this job if this is what you're facing every day? Uh, this is insanity. When I started this job prior to 2004, again, did they happen? Yes, very, very rare. To now where it's just it's becoming common. And we just had Oakdale police officer shot at in March with a person with uh, severe mental health issues and just started shooting at the cops. So this is a major concern something we're, we're trying to get our arms around and understand how are we going to recruit people and retain people to want to work in this profession but just the other effects of this that we're starting to experience is with such the limited amount of police officers available less than 400 law enforcement students enrolled over 200 police departments hiring many hiring for multiple positions which the consequence to us like locally too is uh, it's, a, it's a tough market, so 
If you're a police department that wants experienced people and the market's flat, you start reaching out to other officers in other departments, say, we can pay you $20,000 more a year. You can get promotion opportunities from the second you walk in the door. You know, all these other opportunities, so that's creating uh, just a, a really odd market, something we've never really experienced in this field. But I think that's about my time. We've got, we've got about five minutes here for questions. Okay. I'm, I'm going to ask the first one. Yeah. Because okay. I'm in charge here, so. <laughs> anyway, um, so you've got these fentanyl, people selling fentanyl to their customers, and they're killing them. So why would you, if you were a dealer, why would you sell a killer drug to, to your customers? You're going to run out of customers eventually, right? So why would you do that? Okay, go ahead. Because it's highly addictive and you don't okay. kill them all. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's highly addictive, just like uh, uh, we all have different tolerance levels. Fentanyl is addictive? Oh, yes, highly addictive. Oh. Yes, it's, uh, but it's also a killer, so. Yep. Because it's not just like that. those pills I'm showing you, those were not, that's just not all fentanyl. That's mixed with other substances. So it may just be little bits, trace amounts here and there, but the reality is, though, you're getting that euphoric feeling. You're getting that pain relief that you might be looking for or just that high that you've been used to or the high you're looking for. So that may be different, whereas maybe you popped a few of those counterfeit pills uh, a couple months ago, then you get another one, then you pop that one, they might be completely different and be higher content in fentanyl and you may overdose. Yes, sir. So where do consumers go? I'm in the real estate business, so can they go to the website and, and look up all these stats? Is all this public information? And then if so, can they also look at it? Do you have this set up by areas, you know, areas within the city of where things are happening more than in others? Yeah, so um, there's a few different sources. It was really hard to see, but I did, like, I, I put like a drug rehab U.S. Was, uh, was one that kind of talks national level. Minnesota Department of Health, just the, the Drug Enforcement Administration website. Uh, also, the Minnesota BCA uh, offers different things such as called OD Map that gives kind of mapping images of, of where overdoses are. It's really hard to follow, but as far as like locally for the city of Oakdale, we don't have that ability yet well, to pinpoint. Overall, the crime stats. Oh, crime stats, okay. Yeah, so no, we, uh, we have that available through our website. Uh, it links you right into our, what's connected to our report management system. And it uh, yeah, puts dots on where the crimes are happening and occurring. Um, also, if you find that that's difficult and you just want general information of raw data, you can call the police department or contact um, our records office or me and we can get that, that information too. Yes. Um, thank you for what you do. I can't imagine a tougher job. My son was going to be a cop, and I asked him why he changed his mind. He said because he didn't want to kill. Um, but my question is a little bit on all the gun issues. I know people that have diagnosed mental health problems that have guns, which makes me crazy. But um, my street person said he knows one person in particular comes from Detroit, Big Daddy G and he sells guns in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Goes back to Detroit, comes back with another load. Now are there a task force or, yeah, I mean, I'm sitting there going, if you know this, the police have gotta know. Are there task force, are there things even addressing illegal gun sales? Well, <clears throat> that's a tough one because we, as like a suburb, rely on, we use the ATF quite frequently. Um, so when we deal with maybe some, some bigger issue with gun crimes, we will contact the ATF. For example, we just right across the street here had a kid at pins with a ghost gun with a 30 round magazine and a switch on it. Everything in one of those things illegal. And we sent that to the US Attorney's Office to prosecute them because uh, those kind of, these the oils are the guns that are out on the streets involved in all these shootings. So anytime like we get those kind of situations, we, we, we're gonna jump to the highest level and if the US Attorney's Office will take those, um, we use that. And also, if we get a shooting in the city where there's uh, recoverable evidence, uh, we will work with the ATF to have them bring their resources to, to help us identify who maybe a suspect is. 
another comment. I don't know if people in this room know how easy you can get drugs. Anybody in this room within two phone calls can have anything delivered through their home, maybe one phone call. You know, and I think the access to drugs is horrible. And the blues are everywhere. It is, and you know, what's hard for me is that there are some people that will make a conscious decision that they want to use a, a drug and they want to get high. But there's all these other people that don't understand what they're getting, right? They're, they're not asking for a pill with fentanyl. They're asking, they think they're getting an oxycodone, just something to, to give them a quick high. So that's the concerning thing. That's where these kids in college are popping these pills and overdosing. So doing the best we can through education. Just a certainly an analogy that I heard from those uh, wonderful pills. It's kind of like a chocolate chip cookie. You know, it's, when you get a chocolate chip cookie, some of them have a lot more chocolate chips than others in. You know, when you get the counterfeit pills, some of them can have a ton of that and all that, and some can have just a little bit. It's just haphazard, however they're made, because they're not regulated when they're made for the counterfeit. That's just it. That's it. All right, thank you. Very good, my friend. Thank you.